province, from north to south to east to west, to be pro-action advisors. They're going to administer classroom sessions to their clients. And then in addition to that, there will be um, on-farm services, but that, that the classroom sessions are funded by DFO, but the classroom sessions are, or the, the on-farm sessions are user pay, right? So this is, we're all becoming educated about the program itself, uh, what the, the cut points are, what the targets are, and as a team of, of industry advisors, veterinarians included in that, will be able to advise our farmers how to, to meet those targets. The reason why they decided to go with veterinarians, um, it kind of goes without saying, we're on farms most of the time, every two weeks. We have an ongoing relationship. And from the CQM model, when they did it with CQM, farmers had a 75% chance of passing their CQM on their first try if they used a veterinarian advisor, and a 38% chance of passing CQM if they decided to go it alone without a veterinarian advisor. So that's a pretty significant um, demonstration that using a veterinarian advisor made an impact. So that's why we decided to continue with that model, um, and that's why I have my job with DFO. From a farmer perspective, they need to understand and comply with all of the program requirements, and they need to take accountability and demonstrate uh, continuous improvement over time. That's a big theme with ProAction is continuous improvement. Where they set the lamest targets now might be different in five years. Right? We're, we're talking about continuous improvement over time. Should health farmers not have been part of that training? Of which training? Of the, the, of the advisor training? Of the so advisor training. The, with the advisor training of the veterinarians, we covered animal care, so all aspects of it that we're going to go over, biosecurity, livestock traceability, and environmental sustainability. So animal care and traceability and biosecurity are very much in the wheelhouse of the veterinarian. Environmental sustainability is a little bit out of that. What DFO is, is aiming to do is have this type of session, this type of education session with as many industry partners as possible to make them aware of the program requirements. So veterinarians um, become trained as a pro-action advisor, and then they also need to be knowledgeable about all of the program requirements to be able to provide that on-farm guidance as part of their professional services. So that could be about colostrum management with calves, that could be about barn design and stall size, that could be about um, biosecurity protocols, um, disease testing, all, all of those different things they need to be familiar with. And industry partners support the farmers during their implementation, do what they can to make it as easy as possible, as pain-free as possible, and be knowledgeable about it, um, all of the requirements, to help with the positive messaging. There's no value in continuing the rumor mill. This is really important that everyone come at it with a positive attitude, understand the roots of why we're doing this, why it's important, what the value is to not just the farmer, but the dairy industry as a whole, and, and be, part of, be a part of the progress. As far as com compliance goes, um, we already touched on the dates of, of, of when they're actually going to be rolled out. One thing that's really important to remember is that farmers are expected to be compliant with the program as of the implementation date. So for animal care and livestock traceability, they need to be compliant as of September 2017, regardless of when they have their on-farm validation. This is different than CQM. They had, three, they had to have three months of records before their on-farm CQM validation date, and that was acceptable. Now, when the FSR shows up to do their validation, they're going to be looking back. Hey, have you been compliant since the date that you were supposed to be compliant? Some of those things they're going to be able to tell, and some of them they're not. What are the, what are the rules for this animal care and livestock traceability? Like the identification or? We're going to talk about it. We're going to go through every single requirement. So it's the FSRs that are going to be uh, doing the validation. So they're going to do it just. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, the FSRs are going to be doing the validations, and they are going to um, show up on the farm. They're going to do it just like they do now: milk quality, grade A inspection, and then they're going to incorporate all of the all of the other aspects. Just verification, Kelly, when you're saying FSR, you are referring to the DFO field service person? Yes, FSR is field service rep. Thank you. Yes. Milk inspector. 
So they are going to be following, the on-farm validations are going to happen on their regular schedule. Their CQM date is their pro-action date. It has the same grade A. Okay, grade A in Ontario is based off of the, the Milk Act. And, it, and it's provincial. And so all of those requirements come from that document. And, and, and that is very separate inspection that's done on behalf of the provincial government that is separate from the quality assurance program. DFO's goal is to make it seamless, like it feels like one inspection, and so they're working really hard that when there's overlap, they're not asking the same question over and over again, even though it might appear in many different sections of the quality assurance program, but, but they're different. And, and so when those spot checks happen, when they have like the surprise visit from the, from the milk inspector from the FSR, they're focusing on grade A, okay? They're not focusing on the animal care and the traceability stuff. They're doing that on behalf of the provincial government for a safety perspective and a grade A perspective for the shipping of quality milk. And that's what this is. That's what the front page is. Yeah, so in your, in your book, you have a, a little booklet. Uh, I think it's a uh, little package on the, one, on the right hand side. It has the front page of all of the grade A requirements, all on one page. Has anybody not got one of these? The next section is all of the CQM requirements, and then you have the list of all of the different requirements for animal care, for traceability, and for biosecurity and environment. But it's really important to know that the <coughs> biosecurity and the environment requirements, they're not happening for a couple of years yet, and they are still subject to change, okay? Don't, don't hold that as, you know, 10 years from now, that document might not be valid, right? Even, even three years from now, especially for the biosecurity and environment, that's just as we know it today. But as far as the rollout in 2017, the animal care and the traceability, those are the requirements. So, uh, Kelly, yeah. do we have a responsibility as hoop trainers to report something that doesn't look right? The question is, is do you have a responsibility as hoop trimmers to report something that isn't right? I don't think that there is a legal obligation at all for hoof trimmers to report something. There is for me as a veterinarian. Yes, I realize that. I have a legal yeah. obligation. There also is from a, from a DFO perspective, they have a partnership with um, a, a, a MOU, agree, an agreement with the SPCA to be able to um, make sure that those things are identified and they will, they, they can and will report things to the SPCA. But as a general public or as a hoof trimmer, no, you do not have a legal obligation might have a moral obligation, but you don't have a legal one. Uh, food safety, we're, we're not going to go through that. You guys have all the list of the requirements there, but just to kind of go over it, I mean, it, it is the biggest part of ProAction. It takes up the most space in, in as far as volume goes, as requirements. There's 66 requirements across eight categories. You guys have already uh, been through the ringer, I guess, as far as you've already been familiarized with C2M over the past few years. Uh, there's been very little change since the rollout, um, and you can find any the, the new the new version or the most recent version of the program again on the DFO website. Okay, what you've all been waiting for, animal care. I know. I don't have a little drummer. For those practices, there needs to be an SOP in place. And it's really focusing on pain control. So they must use pain control when dehorning. If calves are over six months of age, they must use pain control at castration. If they brand them, they must use pain control. Not a common practice here. And when removing extra teeth, they need to, it needs to be done with the proper equipment. So it needs to be a scalpel blade or a surgical instrument. Um, but it's totally okay for farmers to continue doing that practice themselves if they do do it. Um, or if the veterinarian or vet tech does it, that's okay too. But no requirement for pain for that. Are they going to search for foods that they actually have, like pain relieving medications on the farm to say, like, is it just like, yes, I do it, signed off, or are they going to actually look for a patient? Mm -hmm. So there, there should be a paper trail, right, because lidocaine has a meat withdrawal, so there should be a paper trail um, that should be recorded. For some farms, might not actually have the stuff on the farm because it's a vet veterinarian that does it or it's a vet technician. Yes, I know. Um, so our vet, my vet techs, like when I do it, the the farmer writes down which calves we dehorned and, and then the, the withdrawal. Like I have a protocol in place, so they, they do have to record it. Um, and the technicians actually, they leave a little document. So, yes? Any chance that 
treatment, like ulcers and whatnot, are going to fit into that category at some point? Great question. I, I think that that's an excellent question because there are some times where, where things are done from a hoof trimming perspective that we know that they're painful. Um, and at what point, like, where's the boundary, right? Are, are hoof trimmers going, are they allowed to use pain control and, and does the veterinary need to sign off on that? Mm -hmm. Does the farmer need to sign off on that? Do we need to teach farmers how to um, do local blocks for, for doing stuff? Uh, it's a great question. At this time, it's not in there, but certainly there are painful procedures that do fall in that. Need to provide prompt medical care for cattle that are sick, injured, too thin, so body condition score less than or equal to two, uh, in pain or suffering. So this is another vague one, right? Like what is prompt? What is suffering? These are a little bit ambiguous to some, in some cases. Um, and so, you know, prompt for some people might be, okay, if I can get there tomorrow, that's good, versus prompt needs to be like, you need to be here within the hour kind of, kind of a situation. Um, this is very difficult to validate, okay? So when, when the FSRs go to the farm to do their inspection, and they already do this, is let's say they're walking around and they come across a cow that's really thin, and he says to the farmer, hey, what's going on with this cow here? And the farmer says, what do you mean? There's nothing wrong with her. Okay. If there's clearly it's an emaciated cow, she's limping, say, you know, there's those types of things, um, there may be a, a concern that prompt medical care is not being provided. Versus when he says, hey, what's going on with this cow here? And the farmer says, oh, that cow, she had twins, and then she had a DA, and then she blew an ulcer. Like, I just, yeah, I the vet out three times. The hoof trimmer was here yesterday. Yeah, okay. They're providing prompt medical care, right? Things are being addressed. That's the type of thing that consumers just want to know that farmers are acknowledging and addressing that, there's, that if there is a problem, that they're getting help or, or dealing with it. They don't necessarily have to have the vet come. They can, they can deal with some of these things themselves, um, but just to, to acknowledge that. This one, I think, kind of fits in with, with hoof trimmers a little bit. I mean, um, you know, how, if one of your clients calls you, with, with a really lame cow, are you gonna are you gonna go there in the next couple of days, or is it kind of like, wow, my schedule, I'm not gonna be back there for for three weeks, and and so then what then what do they do? do they call their veterinarian. What what happens? So that's a that's a good area for discussion. Need to have an, a standard operating procedure for euthanasia. It doesn't mean that they that it's totally okay to use any of the accepted methods of euthanasia that are listed in the code of practice. So I get quite asked, is it okay if I if I use a gun and shoot the cow? Yes, it's okay, as long as you use the proper gun in the proper spot. Um, also, veterinarians sometimes are the ones that are performing the euthanasia, so that's okay. With this SOP, they need to make sure that the animal is dead, that it's done in a timely fashion, animals aren't left to suffer, and they don't move them before they confirm that they're dead. So is it okay for us as a hoop tripper? The farmer will say, uh Geez, you know, with these new rules, uh, I got to get the vet to euthanize this cow. And I, then I can say, well, geez, I was at a hoof trimming conference and you can use your gun. Yes, please say that. Yeah, like. Yeah, as long as, as, long as he knows. And, and so I, I've been caught by this. I'm like, oh, so I want to shoot her. I'm like, okay, you know, you know where to shoot her? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, no. <laughs> so just make sure that they truly are capable and, and understand the proper methods, right? So what is, can you inform us? What, yeah. wh where do you shoot her? Sure, so it, just for after you leave today and you wanna know, um, you're gonna go to the Code of Practice. There's a link on the Dairy Farmers of Ontario website. It's called the Code of Practice for the Care and Handling of Dairy Cattle. And there is a um, um, diagram. diagram, thank you. Oh, okay. There's a diagram. And so you're gonna go, you make an X from the corners of the eye to where the horns are. So it's going to be above, it's not here, it's more like here, okay? So there's, there's a diagram, so you're going to make an X. Same place you shoot a wolf. Mm -hmm. X marks the spot over. Yeah. Copy. X yeah. marks the spot over. You can print that off if you have that, like just print the page off, go to Staples, yep. we'll get it laminated, and leave it in your box. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Five years, yep. And you might be able to request a paper copy of that <coughs> code of practice. I don't think there's a lot of them around, but um, if you contact the, uh, the National Farm Animal and Welfare, no? They need to have the milking herd evaluated, so that's lactating and dry cattle. 
and I, I have a question for you, Clem, about that, about the dry cow stuff, so you yeah. can talk about that. Um, for body condition score, hock, knee, neck injuries, and lameness. So this is Holstein Canada classifiers that are doing this, this assessment, is, this is okay? They have to keep a record of the results, and they need to take corrective actions. This, this, this second part about taking corrective actions when the Hertz scores are in the yellow or red zones, we're just going to ignore that for now because we don't really know where the yellow and red zones are. Because what we're going to do is we're going to, they're going to look at every single farm in Canada. As soon as they, they, as soon as they have enough information, they will start to um, give feedback as to where people are, are sitting as far as in the percentiles. But the yet green, yellow, and red zones are going to be based on percentiles of all of the farms across Canada. Okay? So we don't know where that is yet, so we're just going to ignore that. But looking forward, it's the, the, where they draw the line in the sand is going to be based on the percentiles of all of the farms. Dry cows are excluded. Dry cows are excluded. So originally they were going to look at dry cows, and I think it's just too complicated. Just, uh, dry cows <coughs> have a location sometimes, so not going to do dry cows. Thank you. Neck injuries. <clears throat> The new high head rails and tie saw barns, they got the cows on the top. Is that a problem? Well, I'll show you the pictures. Um, okay, so we already talked about that. You need to have it, <coughs> it has to be done within the 12 months leading up. Um, it is Holstein Canada. It needs to be a random sample. Okay, so this is the random sample part. This is the sample size chart that's being used. It's to get a 95% confidence level with a 15% margin of error. Okay, so got a 100 cow herd they're going to assess 30 cows. That's what they need. That's the number of animals, the minimum number of animals they need to assess to be 95% confident with a 15% margin of error of what, of what that, that is a representative sample of the lameness and body condition score and injuries for that herd. This is stats. How are they going to decide which 30 to pick up the herd? Perfect. So it needs to be random. This is the thing. It's not classification. So just because an animal was classified, does not mean she's included in this group. In fact, it, it, like, it's totally separate, okay? That was one of the concerns about that's bias, right? Oh, if, if it's classified animals, that, that's not fair. So it needs to be random. This will be done, so for the 100 cow herd, they need to do 30. So if they're doing them, let's say, that, let's say it's a tie stall, they're gonna do every third cow. You're not gonna get distracted by the super lame cow. You're only gonna do every third, and you're just gonna set that, that in place. If it's a, doing them as they come out of the parlor, it's every third cow that comes out of the down the, down the alley. That one is going to have to really be watched because uh, they, Chuck Gard did a test in, in New York State and they were only correct on something like 40%. Well, lucky for us, we have Clem Nash here, who is the trainer of the assessors. And you did that this week, right? We did. Yeah. It's fun. It's incredibly rigorous training, I'm telling you. I've, I've taken training, brief as it was, from Clem.